Okay, theory. When somebody famous dies, there are two groups of people. The people who mourn them endlessly, the people who play back their records or their films or whatever they were known for, for weeks on end. They maybe take a day off work. They're very sad about it. And the second group of people who are the people who were like, who's that? And then they either go on to find out who that person was or they just get on with their day and turn off Twitter. Now, I often fall into the camp of being the person who only really learns who a famous person is once they die. A really early example of this, and I remember this very vividly, Frank Sinatra died when I was seven. Now, I wasn't really great at pub quizzes when I was seven and I didn't have that much general knowledge and I'd never heard of Frank Sinatra, but they started screening his movies on a freaking loop on the four TV channels we had and that's when I first watched Guys and Dolls and uh having only really been exposed to the sound of music before that Guys and Dolls was one of my very memorable entry points into my love of musicals as a genre. Now in more recent history a very very famous person died a few months ago Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim is a writer and composer. He's widely acknowledged to have changed musical theatre history and the styles that we now have today forever. But with this death, I kind of fell in two camps. Two of my favourite musicals were written by Sondheim, Sweeney Todd and Company. But apart from that, I honestly didn't know that much about the man and I hadn't really listened to any of his other musicals, I don't think. Now though, suddenly I seem to be in a weird research spiral that I can't get out of where I just literally cannot get enough of Sondheim trivia. Little facts, little little stories, the history of Sondheim. I'm even listening to a podcast at the moment where they go through every single song he ever wrote. Each song gets an hour or an hour and a half to itself and I am freaking loving it. <laughs> However, something weird happened. Before I started researching Sondheim, I genuinely thought he was a genius. He's written these two incredible musicals that I admire so much. They're literally works of art. How could he not be a genius? And actually, the more I learned about Sondheim, not only did I start thinking, not a genius, but I started changing my idea of what genius is in the first place. And that's the ride we're going on today. You do not need your musical theatre kid ticket or pass or membership card to get into this video. I am going to be talking about Sondheim, but there's going to be some wide and roving discussions of other stuff. So I hope you come along for the ride. Here is what I learned by digging in to the life and works of Stephen Sondheim. Number one, it wasn't all him. I don't know why this fact passed me by, but whenever people listed like great works of Sondheim, they, they listed Sweeney Todd and they listed all of the other stuff and they always listed West Side Story and Gypsy. Now these two shows, uh, he was involved, but they're kind of listed in the same way that they are with the rest of his works, implying that he wrote it all. But actually he was only the lyricist for West Side Story and Gypsy. There were some of his first projects and now I'm thinking about it, it shows like West Side Story, no offense to West, West Side Story fans, but like it's not the best musically in my opinion. So when I realized and I was going through it that actually he wasn't big parts of those projects, in some ways that was a relief or at least like, relief's probably the wrong word, but it, it just made sense to me. But it led me down this other rabbit hole of like, hang on a second, if in my layman's audience brain, I always forget that there is always a lyricist and always a composer, who else was involved in the process of these incredible musicals that I love so much? Was it just Sondheim on his own? I think it's worth remembering that whoever is dead or whoever is being discussed at the time often gets credited with the work that they were part of. But when Leonard Bernstein died, I'm sure that he was made out to be the creator of West Side Story and that's what was in his obituary. This is kind of obvious, I guess, when you work in an industry and when you're out of it, like it just doesn't come into your head and that's completely fair. I had that experience when I worked in the publishing industry for almost a decade. And once you're behind the curtain and you read the raw files that the authors are sending in, and then you read it after the editors have finished with it, you're like, oh, that's a good editor. That's not a good, right? That's a good editor. <laughs> the editors have actually sometimes got a really big artistic hand in how a book comes out. And to say most books are a huge collaboration is not even doing it service. So why wouldn't I think that about the musical theater industry? I don't know, but I didn't think of it and it was really interesting. From what I can tell, this isn't unusual, 
But it's also worth noting that with most of Sondheim's projects, they weren't his ideas, they weren't his characters, they weren't his concepts. He was hired to come on and write the music and sometimes the lyrics. But he weren't the he weren't the creator. He wasn't the person with the big idea. True even for Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd was actually one of the only projects I think that he actually initiated and tried to make happen. He was like, I think this should be a musical. Let's get this going. Can I find a producer? Let's go. But he still didn't come up with it. In 1973, he went to go and see a play called Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. And that play was by Christopher Bond. And Christopher Bond didn't write Sweeney Todd either. If you go back and you go back, Sweeney Todd is actually the creation of an author we don't know the name of. It was a penny dreadful serial in 1846 to 1847 in England. It was called The String of Pearls, A Domestic Romance. And if you go back and read that, as I have, you'll see that all the characters are there, all of the concepts are there, all of the atmosphere, everything is already there. That was already served not only to the playwright Christopher Bond, but also to Sondheim himself. Another thing I really admire about Sondheim is this really distinctive organ-like music that's so foreboding and to my ears unique and creative and amazing. However, that sound, which I thought was so distinctive, is actually this thing called Dies Irae. It's a Gregorian chant. It was composed in, I kid you not, probably around the 600s. Yeah, the, the 600s. And it's a sequence of notes that sounds foreboding. Here it is. Sound familiar? Now this doesn't take away from the talent and, and my awe of Sondheim's work, but it does show that when you're not part of a creative process or you're not familiar with a creative process in a certain field, you tend to want to see in your mind's eye, even subconsciously, this idea of a lone genius in a tower writing their work in isolation and then throwing it down to the paupers below. But isolation isn't really how most great work has been made. And bearing that in mind and thinking, if this is a work of genius, we kind of have to crack the crown and everybody gets a piece. This thing is so good. Obviously not one person could have made it. Like, how was I, how was that working? The second thing that shocked me about my research about Sondheim was how much circumstance played into how he got to where he was with his career and with his life. He very matter-of-factly admits that, yeah, he learned piano when he was a kid, but he didn't really enjoy it. He wasn't really that enthused about it. It was just what, in quote marks, good Jewish boys did. He also wasn't that interested in writing music or musicals at all. It was only when his parents got divorced and his mum, who, side note, seems super abusive, moved down the road from none other than casual Oscar Hammerstein. Yeah, o Oscar, Ham Oscar Hammerstein. Stephen, or Steve, became best mates with Oscar's son, who was around the same age, and he basically became a bit of a surrogate son to Oscar Hammerstein. He took him under his wing. He admired Oscar so much, he said that it probably didn't matter what Oscar's profession was. If Oscar had been a geologist, Stephen would have wanted to be a geologist. If Oscar had been an architect, Stephen would have wanted to be an architect. It so happened that Oscar was an award-winning, genre-defying composer who wrote all of the Western world's favorite musicals at that time. But yeah, he worked. I'm not saying he didn't work. He relentlessly wrote musicals from the age of 15 and was presenting them, performing them to Oscar for his critique and guidance. Um, but his first break as well, here's another thing. His first break came from when he was at a party and he met someone who would put him up for this very small job of writing the just the lyrics. The music had already been locked in. Somebody else was already doing the music. Just the lyrics for this small time, probably gonna be a bit of a flop. Tiny little musical, West Side Story. Coincidence? Probably. Random? Absolutely not. And the third mind-blowing example of this idea of circumstance when it comes to Sondheim's genius is a song that I love called The Little Things. It's played by this character called Joanne from Company. It's very, very famous. Patti Lapone particularly is famous for performing it. And the critics are always like, oh, it's so clever because it's so brittle and hollow, but also so sharp. And they particularly love that kind of clinky, clonky xylophone effect kind of thing in the music that's supposed to be very clever, very innovative, etc, etc. Stephen Sondheim himself said, it would be nice to claim that the clinky xylophone-like accompaniment in the little things we do together is meant to reflect the brittle and hollowness of Joanne and her fellow sophisticates, but in fact is the result of when I wrote it, while I was on the Queen Mary during one of my transatlantic trips, 
Casual. It was arranged for me to have a small salon room complete with pianos so that I could work while I travelled. But the ship kept listing starboard and I unwittingly kept sliding towards it on the piano bench, resulting in a preponderance of treble plinks. Thus is insightful art produced sarcastic of course but i like the fact that it wasn't that he thought of like shimmying down the keyboard or he did this kind of weird thing it was literally just because the ship was rocking so much he couldn't write anything else so i guess what we learn from this section is that if you are a would-be genius it also helps to be living on the right street around the corner from the right composer at the right parties and of course on the right boat the third thing i learned from researching sondheim was it's not creativity it's problem solving stephen sondheim was a massive and obsessive collector of puzzles physical puzzles mental puzzles sign him up he's there he actually even wrote crosswords like hired to do that by magazines and they were published it was a whole thing he only gave up to write company because he got too busy picture etching yes <laughs> go woman man yes go come uh, halt. Stop. Very good. One of his most famous songs that if you haven't heard of Sondheim, you probably have heard this song, Send in the Clowns, wasn't written in blood over weeks and months of rights and rewrites and crying and struck down lightning bolt creativity. No, no, no. In the very last week of rehearsals for A Little Night Music, they needed a plaster song, like a, a, a song that linked two scenes together. Something felt like it was missing. And the director was like, look steve we need something else this is this isn't working we've got a week before we open we need a, we need a song we need a song tomorrow so he went home and he wrote a song in a night and it was called send in the clowns most of the the creative decisions he says that he used to to create it weren't really based on like divine inspiration but more the ability and the voice quality of the actress at the time glynis johns the song was thrown in <laughs> to the show the next day bish bash bosh wasn't really a hit. Nobody really remembered the song until it started getting picked up later in life because famous people started singing it, basically. Also, side note, did you know that Tomorrow, the, the really famous song from Annie, was written to cover a scene change for the stage musical? Like, they were like, we don't have enough time to get this set on and that set off. We're gonna need a song. Please pull one out of your ass. And whoever wrote that did. So it's not that this isn't creativity, but it's definitely more on the problem-solving side of things. And especially when you work within cons constraints, like historical, Sweeney Todd, the fact that all the characters and the setting and stuff had already been written. When we think about creativity, I think a big part of it a lot of the time is problem solving, which if you think about it, makes a lot of sense. Apparently composers and people who are really good at music are also often really, really good at maths. They like come as a pair. So I think when we kind of tap into our own creativity and we sit down with a blank page and we're like, hmm, what should we create? Maybe we don't need to look for blank pieces of paper to kind of pull from, but actually just look at problems to solve. Look at narratives that existed before and how to fix them or to make them better. It's just a lot of food for thought for me, to be honest, because I was like, oh, I guess sometimes you slave away for weeks on something or months or years and it doesn't work. And then you do something overnight with the skills that you've acquired from trying to do something for three years and you make something history changing. Sure, sure. So what are the takeaways? What am I sending you home with in a little cardboard box? The first one is if genius is did exist, which I don't really think that they do, but if they did exist and you were a genius, you probably wouldn't know because if Sondheim was a genius, as many people claim that he was, he certainly didn't freaking think so. He really wasn't happy with his work on West Side Story, even though he's really, really famous for it. He said that the characters don't sound anything like themselves when they're in song. They only, they have a completely different dialect between singing and talking, which uh, I agree with Steve. It's okay, we forgive you. He really doesn't like that song, The Little Things, that he's really famous for again, that he wrote on the ship. Hates it hates it. He particularly hates the line, cleanest of crimes. He literally said this in his book, this line is a meaningless embarrassment. And certainly not everything he touched turned to gold. He had a lot of flops and he's very open about that. He never claims to be a genius. The only time that I've seen him like do a bit of a bold move was when he was on Desert Island Discs and he picked his own song. He was like, I want to hear this for the rest of my life when I'm deserted on a desert island, which is a power move. I'll give him that. The next learning, I think, is that you don't have to have the raw material you think you do. Just like I said, this blank slate thing, 
we can't be having it. I was reading this book last year called Beg, Borrow and Steal by Robert Shaw. And it's a really intelligent and brief look at this idea of like the difference between copying and inspiration and like how the lineage of our human ideas have carried on through generations and between cultures. He said that modern Western humans love the idea of a vacuum when they try to formulate this, like, this great idea of genius. And it's part of the romanticisms movement um, that has a, this fantasy of Trabula, rasa or the clean slate this idea is that you are born as a clean slate and all your experiences are what makes you 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 don't really have anything innate about you and then that has translated also into this idea of art being a, a blank slate and the true artist must be standing alone with a blank slate in front of him and, th and that's how he does it i don't agree and i think sondheim's biography attests to that creativity is usually evolving and remixing the concepts and ideas that are already out there in in the world point that proves that in Sondheim's life you know that company musical okay it's one of the most famous musicals of all time for its depiction and accuracy and complex thoughts about marriage and divorce he wasn't married when he wrote that at all was not married he actually said he only fell in love when he was in his 40s so after company was first staged he actually only ever got married in 2017 when he was 87 years old he admits I didn't know anything about marriage, but I wanted to write a musical about it. So I got one of my friends drunk and I got her to tell me everything she thought and had experienced in marriage. And I took extensive notes and then I wrote this musical on that. The idea that this guy has this insight into this very universal experience that he obviously observed with an incredible amount of intellect and emotional intelligence but actually never experienced himself kind of blows my mind and when i think about my own life and what raw material is there and then i despair because i'm like well i don't want to write about that trauma and that's not very interesting and that thing never happened to me it's sometimes a comfort <laughs> to know that somebody who wrote one of the most insightful pieces of art about marriage hadn't experienced it at that point in his life. And the third and final takeaway I think we can have from all of this is it is what you bring to the work and your encounter with the work that matters the most. Like with the Penny Dreadful and the Gregorian chant, I had not encountered those things before. Sweeney Todd was the vessel that brought those things to me. That was the form that those things found me in and I still got awe out of that. I still thought it was cool. It added an incredible amount to my experience of the musical. When you encounter what you perceive as one person's genius, you're actually probably encountering hundreds, if not thousands of people's geniuses or cleverness transposed and retold over millennia. We can see this also in the works of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, total ripoff, and also arguably in the work of JK Rowling. Please read this book to answer the question, do you like the wizarding world or do you just like British and worldwide folklore? The concept that I got the most out of when it comes to Sweeney Todd is the critique of capitalism, this eat the rich. What I read is clearly anti-capitalist propaganda. How Prince, the director of Sweeney Todd, agreed with that critique and he apparently made sure the set was designed in a way that was really mechanical and it was about the industrial revolution and and people fitting in as cogs in a machine and etc etc however Sondheim completely and passionately disagreed with that reading of the play he was like no this this play is about obsession what power can do to one man it's not about capitalism or the industrial revolution at all which is amazing and kind of again makes me think Sondheim not a genius love him but what i got out of sweeney todd is it not in fact what he intended to give me there's a great ted talk about this concept by elizabeth gilbert because she talks about having this big smash hit called eat pray love and everybody then it, hence treating her like a genius when in fact she didn't know she could ever write a book like that again she didn't know how she wrote it she wasn't even sure if it was a good book and she talks about this spanish phrase ole when you're watching bullfighting right and, and stuff like that is it actually means apparently god in you god in you like ole you're doing well amazing i can see god in you and this older concept of instead of thinking somebody is doing something incredible before me must be a genius they're saying i see a little bit of god in you i just got a glimpse of god through you i know that it's not you and you are not the end point of this creation but i'm seeing god in you which as a, an agnostic translates to me as like the the collective genius of humans the the kind of received 
work that everyone has been doing over generations and i mean maybe we can get into energy but i'm not sure <laughs> but this idea that it's like i see something through you in you i got a glimpse of something cool through you thank you rather than like oh my god you are god you're a genius i will worship you you're my idol now let's end on a quote from Camus, shall we because i am a pretentious arsehole but i did read this lecture called create dangerously and i thought there were parts of it that were really really interesting on the one hand genius is expected to be splendid and solitary on the other it is called upon to resemble all alas reality is more complex balzac suggesting in a sentence the genius resembles everyone and no one resembles him the artist chooses his object as much as he is chosen by it art in a sense is a revolt against everything fleeting and unfinished in the world and i like this idea of being chosen by a moment or by art or by a very wonky ship that makes you play the wrong notes that actually sound kind of cool i'm going to write that down and this idea that good work comes from weird and murky and complicated places an obituary is essentially a hyped up version of an instagram highlights reel like you only hear in retrospect whether somebody was a genius or not and who decides that it seems to me the only way to make anything pretty good is to at least start and hopefully all the weird and wonderful stuff happens to you along the way and for me i guess getting really geeky and nosy about the life of somebody's work i really really admire reminded me that there's nothing magical about it but you won't make it if you don't start thank you so much for watching this video i could not have made this video without the incredible podcast putting it together if you also want to get really geeky about sondheim would highly highly recommend i've left lots of sources and suggestions if you are nosy as me about sondheim below but also i'd like to hear from you who are some people that you admire who's what's some work that you love and have you ever found out that it's come from more than one place or more than one person i'd love to hear about that in the comments this video and all of them like it are made possible by the gumption club they tip me per video to make sure that these videos are free for everybody to watch and continue happy Happening. nice of them thank them in the comments what a splendid bunch here are some other videos that if you watch this one i think you might like it particularly maybe the helena bonham carter video i'm not a genius but i do have some art coming out next year it is the bargain bin rom-com it's the poetry collection i wrote you can pre-order it below thank you so much for watching frogs nog out